In August of 2013, Malia and I uh, woke up very early, got dressed in some, some comfortable clothes, and uh, headed over to one of our favorite coffee shops in Springfield. It was still dark out uh, when we got there. We were the only people there, aside from uh, the, the staff, the barista working, and ordered some breakfast food, which is a little unusual for me when I go to a coffee shop. I'm just really focused on the coffee most of the time. And Malia probably got something like a you know gluten-free donut or something healthy. I know I didn't order that, but we got those, got a couple lattes, and we sat there in the dark and, and just had, had this really nice conversation talking about the future, talking about our, our plans and our excitement for things that were happening and what we knew was, was coming in the future. And, and we got in eating, we took our, our coffees with us, we, we got into the little red Kia Rondo, if any of you remember that little red Kia that we had when we uh, moved here. And we, we loaded up in that, we drove over to Cox Medical Center and, and went in the, the West Pavilion entrance and got checked in and they took us back to the labor and delivery unit. Our doctor had scheduled uh, Malia for induction on, on that day, and so we got in there early that morning, they got the process started, and, and by the end of that day, about five, a little after five o'clock that night, Tobiah was born, and uh, it, was, it was an awesome day. There's a lot happening, you know, of course, uh, Tobiah is our, our first kid, and so all these new experiences, all this joy, lots of stuff happening all around us, right? But one thing I will never, I, I, I think, ever forget in my lifetime was after Tobiah was born, and they'd gone through all the stuff, getting the measurements and all those, those kind of things, before her parents had gotten to come in, they're all down in the waiting room and everything, I remember Malia, this my incredible little strong wife, looking over to me and going, well, that wasn't so bad. Now what? <laughs> and I still to this day don't know if that was just the epidural talking or she's just really that tough and I should not ever pick a fight with her. I'm not sure. But... <laughs> It was a big day in, in our lives, the birth of our first child. We knew things were going to change. It was exciting kind of change. And that question that she asked, well, now what? It certainly wasn't the last time we would ever ask that question, right? I mean, just a few days later is when we were heading out of the, the hospital. That thought probably entered our mind. Well, well, now what do we do as we get home with this little baby and, and all the things that will change in our life? Like, for instance, I don't think ever since that day in 2013 have we ever been able to get up early and go to a coffee shop alone <laughs> and have a nice, quiet conversation, right? Life is just different than it was before he entered the world. But all of us, I think, can, can relate to the question in our life, right? We've, we've been in situations, you've been in situations in your life where you've thought, okay, what's next? Like, what's going to happen in the future? What, what is to, to come, right? Coming off of this, this last week of celebrations, we, we remembered specifically the death of Christ and, and how he, as our substitutionary sacrifice, came and, and gave his life and then rose from the dead in this victorious conquering of, of sin and hell and the grave itself. And, and yet, on the other side of that amazing weekend and all those things that took place, we can still find ourselves asking this same question and, and, in fact, asking the same question the disciples themselves were asking after all those things took place. Every year when, when we get to this, these few days past the Easter season, I love to reflect on what it was like those, those days for the disciples, the first disciples of Jesus in the first century right after the resurrection. So from the death to, to the resurrection, and then what took place afterwards, this really is kind of the, the most important little segment of history that we could ever really dig into and consider. Because what took place in those days was not only impactful to you and I now, but it was radically transformative to the whole world. And you can see that in the disciples. But even after all they had experienced, even, even after Jesus had, had died and then risen from the dead and appeared in this glorious power to them, they still had the same kind of questions you and I ask in our lives today. Luke tells us there at the beginning of the book of Acts, if you're there, Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, that Jesus presented himself alive to his disciples after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized, excuse me, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. These 40 days following the resurrection, Jesus appears to his followers in, in a number of ways and a number of different 
uh, times, giving amazing proofs of his victory and his power, right? He, he overcomes the doubts and the disbelief of those like Thomas who are questioning, could this really have happened, right? He sets aflame the hearts of disciples who had given up with despair and, and hopelessness at the fact that our Messiah had been killed. And so they set off on the road to Emmaus, right, to leave behind Jesus and all this stuff they had trusted. And Jesus shows up to them and, and invigorates their souls and sets them aflame for him. And Jesus calmed the fears, and he emboldened the men who had abandoned him, who had failed him as his closest followers, who had not lived up to the purpose for which he had called them to. And Jesus, over these 40 days, took weak men who were incapable of doing anything great on their own, and he poured into them, teaching them deep truths about the kingdom of God so they would be prepared and ready for the mission that he had called them to do. But Luke tells us, even in the midst of these great 40 days and all these wonderful things that Jesus is doing, the question is still lingering in their minds. Look at verse 6. So when they'd all come together, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? The question, in essence, is the same question you and I ask in our lives today. Lord, what's next? Right? They were just like us. They wanted to have some clarity. They wanted to have some answers for what was ahead of them. Right? I think about how often the Bible talks about you and I and the way our hearts work and the way we plan and we long for knowledge of the future, for some control of the future. Right? Proverbs 16.9 says, The heart of a man plans his ways. And Proverbs 19.21 tells us, Many are the plans in the mind of a man. This is what our, our hearts and our minds are doing naturally, doing kind of, kind of unprovoked and unprompted in us, right? We don't have to put a lot of intentionality and concentration into it. This is just what's taking place. We're always creating these little plans in our hearts and in our minds, these little personal desires, things we want to see fulfilled. We just can't help but do it. James actually tells us the fact that our hearts are constantly doing this is the explanation for why we have so many of the problems we have in our own lives, right? James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Hey, what causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. This is so true of our lives. This is the explanation for why we have fights and we have quarrels and we have these, these issues. Because none of us, no matter how intentional we're being, like most of us aren't constantly looking at the calendar and, and setting up our time blocks and deciding exactly what we're going to do. But no matter what we're doing in our lives, our hearts and our minds are constantly thinking, I'd like to do this. I think I'll do that. I'm planning on this, right? It's just the natural way that we work. And when those little plans that we're making, without writing them down, without sharing them, without making a big deal about them, when those things get broken, <laughs> we get into all kinds of trouble and it leads to fights and quarrels, right? So married people in the room, <laughs> Let's be honest, right? This is exactly what happens. How many times have you gotten into your mind, like I've gotten in my mind, that you want to do something? Maybe, maybe you know, I want to watch that show that I really like. I want to, get, I want to watch that tonight. Or I, I want to just, I just want to take a few minutes. I've had a long day. I, got stuff. I just want to sit down with my favorite drink. I just want to relax for a few minutes. Or, you know what, I, I think I, I want this for dinner. Yeah, I think that sounds really good. You've just been thinking about it in your mind. Or I'm going to go grab this, this snack or this treat, right? And then... You've got this little plan in your mind, and despite you and I not having said anything about it to anybody else, it's not written on the calendar, there's no you know, big announcement of it, right? Your spouse comes along and ruins everything, <laughs> right? Like, you flip on the TV, and they're like, oh, hey, turn it on to this. I want to watch that show, right? Or, hey, I'm going to make this for dinner. They didn't ask what I wanted for dinner. Or you go to get the treat, and she's eating it. No, oh, sorry. The spouse is eating it. <laughs> not a personal experience there. Not at all. Right? We come up with these little things, and, and despite the fact that we never shared it, we never, this wasn't a plan that we had made together, I just had it in my heart, in my mind, and then it's broken, and the natural response of so many of us is what? They did that on purpose. <laughs> and we get mad. We get upset, and it leads to a fight, an argument, or we get irritable, or pouty, or standoffish, whatever it may be, but it's because something's been going on in our heart. We've made a plan, it's gotten broken, it's not come about the way we hoped, and now we're disappointed, right? This happens all the time. It doesn't just happen in marriage. It happens in all kinds of our relationships as well. The root of it is this is what our hearts and minds are naturally doing. And our personal planning can really get us into a lot of trouble, can't it? <laughs> yeah. 
And even right after the resurrection, here in the book of Acts, the disciples are still struggling with this same reality, the same nature in their own hearts. They had expectations. They had plans that they were building up in their own minds. They thought, okay, this is what it's going to look like. This is what we want Jesus to do for us. And so they thought, okay, Jesus, let's just ask him, hey, Jesus, what's next? Are you going to do the thing we want you to do? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, they, they asked. Now, on the one hand, asking Jesus if this is the time actually kind of makes sense, right? Because, again, just from their perspective, what have they just witnessed? They've witnessed Jesus be, be celebrated as a king, but then betrayed and crucified, then rose again as the Lion of Judah, conquering sin and death and grave. He's majestic, and he's saying things like, all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. Okay, so it's natural to think, okay, now the risen king is here. Now he's conquered the, the, the grave itself. So surely this is the time where b- before he said, don't take up the sword. Before he said, it's not, that's not the purpose. I have something else to do. Now that he's done all that, surely he's going to get over here and drive the Romans out. Surely we're going to go in and all those religious leaders who betrayed him and betrayed their position, he's going to kick them out and clear out the religious system. And now we're going to step into the positions of power. We're going to rule. We're going to reign, right? This, this kind of makes sense from the disciples' perspective, but the response of Jesus is very different than what they were expecting to hear. Look at verses 7 and 8. Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons That the Father has fixed by his own authority. But instead, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is interesting here. The the response of Jesus to all these plans and all these thoughts that they have formulating in their minds and their hearts, it's not to answer those things. Jesus doesn't give them dates. Okay, here's when the kingdom will be restored. He doesn't even give them broad timelines and lay it out so they can kind of see how how the future is getting ready to unfold. He simply explains again their purpose in this life and reminds them of the real mission that they should be focused on then and there in that moment. They shouldn't be worried about the future things to come, the plans, the times, and the seasons. They have something to do right then. That's what Jesus says. So we don't want to miss this because it's, it's, it's really important for us to believe and to trust, especially when we face difficult times in life, that, that God really does have a plan and he really is unfolding things. There are times and seasons fixed by the Father's own authority, as Jesus himself affirms here. And if we go back to those two texts in Proverbs that we've looked at many times before, the latter half of both of those say, while we make our plans, God's ultimately in control, right? Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. In Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but the purpose of the Lord is that which will stand, right? So so God has clear and sure plans for the future, and his plans, they do come to pass. This is where God's different than us, right? And this is where we worship him, and we can trust him, and we can take comfort in our uncertainties because he is certain of the future. He's never disappointed. Everything he plans perfectly happens. Everything he wants, it's never frustrated. It's never stopped. He's never upset the way you and I get upset when our plans get broken. The perfect example, of course, is the life of Jesus. That God's plan, though it may look different than our plan, though it may not be the things we would create in our own hearts and minds, when he sets a plan, it always comes to pass. The events of Jesus' betrayal, his suffering, his death, that led to the resurrection, was all part of the plan of God. In fact, Peter himself will preach that just 10 days after these words in Acts 1 from Jesus in Acts chapter 2, Peter will stand up and proclaim this at the end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, loosening the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it, right? Everything that took place with Jesus, this is why we celebrate the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Everything that took place there was purposeful, Jesus came into this world at the exact right specific time that he came. 
He came and intentionally grew up at, at the exact moments that he did, living first in Egypt and then in, in Nazareth. This was intentional on the part of God. The ministry that Jesus conducted was completely intentional. Every single person who heard his teachings, every person who experienced his healing power, every person who saw a miraculous sign and wonder by the hand of Jesus, all of it was part of the plan of God. Just as we have said over the last several weeks, included this betrayal and this rejection by the religious leaders and the sufferings and the beatings and the mockery and the death itself of Jesus, all part of the plan of God. As Peter says here, part of this definitive plan, this foreknowledge of God, as Paul tells us, all of it was completed in the fullness, the completed, the perfect time he says in Galatians 4. It was the time that God had set to save those who he had set his love on before the foundation of the world in order to make us holy and blameless before him, according to Ephesians 1. This atonement that came by the slain of the Lamb of God on our behalf was all perfectly accomplished just as God planned it, right? His plans are perfect and they never fail, but here's the big difference between you and I, and here's what's true of us and why we should find such comfort that that's true of God. Because God has not made you and I to know the way, the, fu- the future, the way our hearts often wish we could. Right? This is the big difference. We make all these little plans and all these little designs, and we, we have all these things we want to see accomplished, and we have no ability to ensure that they happen. God does, but we don't. We cannot know the future. And that's where such a struggle comes for so many of us. And this is where there's such a danger to so many of us spiritually. Because you and I, since we long to know, we want clarity about what will happen, what we can do is we can begin to seek that and search for that and let the mission that God has given us in the moment go undone. The apostles understood this temptation very, very clearly. It is, I think, in part, why they warned so strongly believers to stay away from false prophets and false teachers. Because one of the things those individuals will do to to try and take us captive is they will give empty, false promises of revealing the future and conveying supernatural knowledge of God's plan to us. And we want that. We want to know what's next. And we can get sucked in, drawn in to those things. So the Apostle John says in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Peter, in, in his epistle at the end of his life, 2 Peter 2, one will write, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. This is all true, and this is not a surprise to God. Jesus himself taught this would be the case. If we take just a few examples from the Gospel of Matthew alone, hear what Jesus says very clearly. Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 24, 11 says, Many false prophets, Jesus says, Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray. Listen, the longing of your heart, my heart, this natural impulse that we have to always be thinking and asking what's next can be very dangerous to us because it can lead us to get drawn into the promises of false teachers and false prophets when they give us false promises about the future. And I'm convinced that puts us in a great place of spiritual danger because it gives a foothold to the enemy. And my, my, my heart, it really is broken over seeing this. As a pastor, what, what I'm called to do is to shepherd the, the sheep, the, the flock of God, right? And, and as the sheep are out and they're, they're in this field, I'm staying there as the shepherd. And I can look up and I can see, hey, beyond the field, there's dangers there. There are wolves all around want nothing more than to prey on the sheep. They want to come in. They want to do that. And sometimes those wolves get crafty and they try to camouflage themselves and sneak in to the flock. And sometimes what's probably most hurtful and devastating for me to observe is when the sheep who are in the field and they're safe and they're together decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander off over here where the wolves are and go check it out for myself. And they just, they just step off in, into danger. 
Instead of trusting, hey, the, the, the shepherd is, is here to protect. The, the, there's a blessing and a benefit of being in the flock. There's protection and safeness here. They say, eh, I'm going to go, go check it out. I'm going to go see. I'm gonna, maybe the wolf's nice. He looks interesting. And so many people willingly step into, into things that are damaging, sometimes damning to their soul. Even this morning, as I was thinking about this, I was praying for us. I was praying for this gathering this morning. My heart was just heavy over this reality. It's tragic, and the danger is so real, and I think it really does come from a natural impulse in so many of us to, to want to know, to think about the future, and when those wolves that are circling say, hey, we'll tell you, we'll show you, we'll give you something interesting to see, so many people get taken captive. May God help us with that in our own lives. May he open our eyes and help us stir up our hearts and minds, give us mercy to remain aware of the dangers that can come. If we come back here to, to Jesus, though, responding to this question from the disciples, they're, they're asking him, what's next, Jesus? What is next? Jesus tells them, instead, they should be focusing on the question of what now, right? He has a mission for them in that moment. He has something for them to be doing right then. And rather than to rush off to the future and rush off to what will come later, Jesus' words to them are actually to slow down and to wait on the Holy Spirit, right? Look at verse 8 again of Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And you could render that, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So uh, let's be really clear what is, is being promised here and the purpose of what's being promised here, right? The purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is not to do signs and wonders. The purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is not the ability to know the future, he doesn't say, wait here, get the Holy Spirit, and then I'll tell you the dates and the times and all that stuff that's going to happen, right? The purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit isn't to gain prosperity or ease or fame or fortune in this life. The purpose of the promised power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to make us witnesses, he says, right? This is what the Bible tells us clearly. This is what Jesus says clearly. The Holy Spirit will come upon you to make you witnesses, that's the purpose. That's the result of the power of God at work in you and I. And, and here's what's amazing is Jesus is saying this to his disciples during these 40 days that he is here with them on the earth before he ascends to heaven, before the, the mission to go and proclaim the gospel to all the world begins. But this promise of the power of the Holy Spirit wasn't just for them. The New Testament tells us that all of us as Christians have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, working in us, empowering us, just as it was those disciples. So Acts 2, 38 and 39, in, in that same sermon Peter's preaching, right? He's preaching now to, to the first Christian sermon, to the first Christian converts who are going to believe. He says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then Paul will continue to say the similar things in, in 1 Corinthians 2.12. He says, now we recognize that we have not been given the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, For in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So here's what the Bible would teach you and I as Christians. When the Holy Spirit is given to us, each one of us, it's so that we can understand the things of God. It is so that as we receive the word, believe in the gospel, the, the Holy Spirit comes and acts now as a seal, a guarantee of our inheritance. What was our inheritance? The eternal life right? Salvation from our sins. This is what the Holy Spirit is in us to do, to, to reveal to us, to show to us. And so he, the, the Holy Spirit, is, is giving us this great benefit personally, and also this power to begin to proclaim the, the message of Jesus Christ, to be a witness to him. This is true of every single one of us. It wasn't just true of the disciples. It's not just true of pastors or evangelists or apostles. They're not the only people who get the Holy Spirit. All believers have the Holy Spirit because all believers are called to be witnesses to Jesus. So we have, in every moment, the power of God at work in us and through us. So when you and I are scared, when we get uncertain, 
when we're worried about the outcomes and the things that may happen and the fact that we can't see the future and we can't know what will take place, or sometimes when we get distracted by just thinking about it but never doing something, right? You can relate to that? As Christians, what we just celebrated was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, right? That God, in his great display of power, rose Christ from the dead, the greatest victory that could ever happen, ever take place in all of history. That's what we're celebrating, right? Here's what Paul says in Romans 8, connecting that moment to your life, to my life as a Christian. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11. The Spirit of God dwells in you. For anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, if you're a Christian, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So what he's saying is this. You might feel weak. You might feel like you are really unable. You might feel like it's really overwhelming. It's really scary to you. You're really uncertain about if you can make the mission of being a witness to other people around you, the priority in your life in this moment. It may seem impossible to you. It may seem like, really, I, I need to share about Jesus with the people that, that, that I've grown up around, the people who, who know me and all the things of my past. Like, they know all those times where, where this, this body gave in to all that temptation and all the stupid things I said and I did and all the mistakes I've made and all the ways that I look like the exact opposite of, of a good, godly person. They know all of that, and now you're telling me I need to be a witness to them. I can't do that. Nothing good can come of that. Paul says, if you're a Christian, if you've been saved by the power of God, then you have in you right now the Holy Spirit, the same one who raised Jesus from the dead. If he can overcome death itself, surely he can overcome embarrassment, fear, someone thinking negatively of you, right? This is the promise that he is dwelling in us and empowering us and enabling us to do what we could never do on our own. So I want you to hear this. This is good, good news for us. You and I as Christians, we have everything we need for the moment in the moment. You have the Holy Spirit in you to make you a witness, to use you as his tool to spread the gospel and see others receive the gift of salvation that you yourself have been given. God doesn't need a better version of you. He's not putting you into a situation kind of unsure of your readiness level, like, eh, we'll just kind of see. He is calling you to trust him and to lean into his power through the Holy Spirit that's working in you, indwelling you right now, to be a witness for him. The power of God that raised our Savior from the dead is the the power that accomplished the greatest work in all of history, and he is living within you and me for a specific purpose, to empower us and enable us to be witnesses for God here and now. Like we should have nothing to fear. We should have no worries. There should be no doubts in our minds that, that this will be okay. He's in us, working through us. So this is, this is what I, I really believe the Lord's saying to us this morning particularly. This challenge has been in my mind and my heart for the last several weeks as I've been thinking and praying and, and seeking. Don't get me wrong. I, I ask the question, what next, a lot. <laughs> I'm a planner. If you know me, you, you know that to be true. I ponder, and I, I strategize, and I, and I try to think of scenarios. A lot of that's just the, the way I'm wired. That's built by my, my background, playing chess. So that's just natural to me, to run scenarios and think through possibilities. And Malia can tell you how often I do this, because we talk about things over and over again, and, and she's long-suffering. It's, it's great. And there's wisdom in planning and intentionality. You've heard me preach that from the biblical text. You've seen God say that in Scripture. So, so don't, don't disconnect these two ideas and say that now I'm trying to advocate some kind of careless living or you don't need to plan or prepare. No, I'm not saying that at all. We need to be intentional with our planning. We need to have long-term goals for the future. When we do those things, we bring glory to God and help focus us so that we don't waste our lives as we are so prone to do. But what I, what I feel the Lord pressed on my heart a lot personally and for us as a church is to not just ask the question of what's next, but rather we need to be asking God, what now, not just what's next? Right? So we need to make plans. We need to, we need to think about the future. Uh, absolutely. But there's a temptation here and a trap that the enemy will lay for us when we spend time thinking about the future if we're not careful. 
when we are always thinking about what is next, what the enemy wants us to do is to focus so much on that that we will stop doing and stop acting faithfully now. Like Satan is more than happy to distract you and I so that we don't live to the glory of God now. He'll send false teachers and false prophets all day long to distract God's people with plans and promises and visions of the future, so long as you don't live out the mission and be a witness to God in this moment. I mean, the Bible's really clear. Satan has supernatural power because he is a supernatural being, and his minions, they can do false signs and wonders. The Bible's clear about that. So don't think for a moment that just because something looks or sounds amazing that you need to give it all your focus. You don't. The words of Christ are clear. His calling for you and I is clear. We are to be witnesses to him right now in this moment. And if what we're doing, if something seems like that should take all our focus, that all of our energy, and it will keep us from being a faithful witness, engaged in the mission of God now, it's not from God. So we live in a day where we're hyper-connected to everything all the time, everywhere else. And it's far too easy to get distracted by that. Don't give in to that. Be ready and be faithful and actually act in the moment before you to be a witness of God. What the Lord has been pressing on my heart is is as I ask him the question, okay, Lord, what is next? To first slow down and ask him, what's now? What do we need to do in this moment, this time, this day? I don't need to always be planning for the future. I need to be present in this moment. And the same is true for you. The same is true for our church. So here's what I, I think the, the challenge for us to hear and to respond to today is. I think, I think we need to ask some questions of our, health, our own hearts, our own lives. We need to ask, what is, what is God asking me to do right now? What actions do I need to take? What can I do right now to be a witness for Christ in this moment of my life? Not not in a week or two weeks or three weeks or four years when I get things cleaned up or I get to that next stage or I get that degree or I get that, that promotion or things are better. Right now, in this moment in my life, how can I be a witness for Christ? How can I trust the Holy Spirit who's living inside of me to enable me to overcome the fear of talking to someone in my circle of friends or acquaintances in this community? We need to ask ourselves, how, how can I engage in conversations with my kids or my spouse that, that will point to and lead to Jesus, even if that feels uncomfortable to me? How can I experience the power of the Holy Spirit at work in me to change my heart and to enable me to overcome and put to death the sins that, that I want to hang on to, that maybe I've been keeping hidden away for, for a while? How can I really have faith that comes from knowing God has established times and seasons and he has a divine plan that will be fulfilled? And worked out perfectly. So I can trust him with the future and live faithfully in this moment. These are the questions I I think we need to to ponder today. Our hearts, our minds, they are so easily, they are so naturally drawn to distraction. Mine mine included. It can be hard for us to be faithful and active in the moment. But this is what God wants for us. So so my heart has just been been burdened with this. to, To be impressed to challenge us today to heed these words of Christ and to ask him to renew our thinking and to deepen our convictions and to make our commitments strong and things we'll actually act on so that we would fulfill the purpose and the mission that he has given us in this moment to be his witnesses. To rightly understand and live in the power that's given to us by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us as believers The one who raised Christ from the dead wants to work through you right now. That's an amazing thought. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In just a moment, we're going to take a a few minutes to respond with with a song and an opportunity for prayer. And and I want to share one one final thing that that I want all of you to pray about, but some of you really need to pray about this. In a couple weeks, we're going to start a new sermon series. We're going to study through the book of Galatians. We're going to focus in on understanding the gift of the gospel. And one of my prayers, one of my, my intentions with this series has been asking God to do what God has, has been so incredible to do over the last 100 years that this church has been here, and that's bring new people here to experience the power of the gift of the gospel. I mean, we're only here because people have come and heard and received and been changed, and, and, and I want that to continue to grow. I don't want to be the, the church that 
celebrates 100 years and then just falls off the cliff, right? So in a couple of weeks, we're going to start this series. And, and one of the things that, that just felt impressed for us to do, again, we've, we've done things like this in the past, but we've ordered cards that have the, the series graphic on it and, and just a simple explanation that says, hey, we're going to be, be studying this book of the Bible, talking about the gift of the gospel, and you're invited to come. And it's got our address, and it's got our service times, and all that stuff. And, and these little cards, when they arrive here, and I'll give them to you in just a couple weeks before we start this sermon series, what, what I'm asking you to do is to just take those and take a step of faith, uh, uh, be a witness who would be bold enough to, to hand out a card. <laughs> and for some of us, that may take, you know, two, three weeks <laughs> to, like, pray through, God, make me bold enough to do that, because that feels really uncomfortable to us. So maybe today, in the midst of all those other questions we have, that, that needs to be one of your prayers. What can I do now, Lord? How can I be faithful now in these moments? Not, not just next year, not just a couple years from now. I want to be faithful in my life right now, these moments you've given me. And I want us to pray to that end and respond to the Lord in, in that way. So Heather's going to start a, a hymn for us. It'll be on the screen. It's a, it's a video hymn. The lyrics and the words will be through the system here. And the altars are open for us to respond. And, and we're just going to proclaim the, the truth of what we're about to hear is that we need him every hour to do in every moment what he has called and what he has given you, the Holy Spirit, in you to empower you to do. So let's ask him, not just what's next, but what now. What now?